In the last video, we went through a problem where we used spectral data to determine the molecular structure of an unknown organic molecule. In this second practice problem, we are going to work through another example of how to go from spectral data, meaning IR, NMR, and MS, or mass spectrometry data, to a complete chemical structure for an organic molecule. I strongly recommend that what you do is go to the handout for chapter 13, which you can find in modules under or under files in Canvas, and that you look at the last problem of that bundle, try to work through that on your own, and then use this video to reinforce or confirm your answer or help you if you are getting stuck with it. You will need to apply this same sort of technique in order to conquer the first project for the semester where you'll be given a set of spectral data and you'll be asked to use those spectral data to propose to me the full structure of an unknown molecule. So let's go ahead and do this example. So taking a look at this problem, the way that I recommend you tackle the workflow for this is to use the outline that I provided in the handout for how to determine organic structures using spectral data. So we've got the molecular formula determined by mass spectrometry. We've got the IR spectrum here in the upper left corner. And in the bottom, we have the proton NMR spectrum. First things first, let's go ahead and calculate the sum of rings plus pi bonds. So I'm going to write rings plus pi bonds. And I'm going to use the formula that is provided there in the handout, which is two times the number of carbon atoms. Number of carbon atoms is four plus two minus the number of hydrogen atoms, which is 10. And I'm going to divide all of that by two. There are no nitrogen atoms and no halogen atoms X within this formula. And so I've omitted those from our equation consideration. So doing this, we determine that the Sum of rings and pi bonds is equal to zero divided by two, hence rings plus pi bonds is going to be equal to zero. So we need to create as the correct structure of this molecule, a compound that has no rings and no pi bonds. So we will keep that in mind. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight that to remind myself that the structure we draw had better not have any rings or pi bonds. Next, we'll explore the IR data in combination with the NMR data. Taking a look at the IR data first in our upper left corner, the two things that I strongly advise you look for within the spectrum are carbonyl signals that generally show up around 1700 inverse wave numbers. And we see no evidence for a carbonyl, which that makes sense and is in agreement with our sum of rings and pi bonds being zero, that if you have no rings and no pi bonds, that means there can be no carbonyl since a carbonyl has a pi bond. Then we look elsewhere in the spectrum, right here at around 3000, these signals that I'm circling are the CH signals. And those tend to be pretty narrow, relatively deep, strong signals. Those can generally be ignored because practically any molecule you're gonna look at will have CH bonds that are part of carbon-carbon single bonds. We come over here though, and we have this tongue-like shaped signal that is broad, and it appears at about 3,300 wave number. And so based on that signal and taking a look at table 12-2 from the textbook or from the chapter 12 handout, we anticipate that this is an alcohol group. So we are fully expecting that we have a carbon directly bonded to a hydroxy group somewhere within our molecule. So let's now use that information plus the molecular formula in combination with the proton and MR data to solve the complete structure of this compound. Remember that the numbers written above the signals indicate their integral. So we have one proton here, two protons here at about 3.4 ppm, one proton here, and six protons showing up at about 0.9 ppm. So thinking about this, if we sum these up, 6 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1, that equals 10 protons as the sum. That corresponds to the number in the molecular formula, which is great. And that indicates to us that within this molecule, what we anticipate is that for our one proton, that means that we have to have a single 
proton, that could be a CH group. The other option, since we have an oxygen in the formula and we saw that the IR supported a hydroxy group, is it could be an OH group as well. Our next one integrates to two, so we predict that to be a CH2 group. The next group integrates to one, and that I'm going to list as a CH group because hydroxy groups are generally singlets because they will not have vicinal hydrogens. They will not have hydrogens on an adjacent carbon. The oxygen is going to prevent that phenomenon from happening generally. And so that's why I labeled this singlet over here as a hydroxy group or a CH group. But then when we have one proton over here, I labeled that as CH since this is clearly a multiplet and not a singlet. Since it's a multiplet and not a singlet, it can't be a hydroxy group. And then we come over to here at about 0.9 PM, ppm. That integrates to six. And the only way I can really think of to come up with six protons most likely is to have two methyl groups that are symmetrical to one another. They have to be symmetrical because they're showing up as a single signal here. This is a doublet, by the way. So now we ask, how can we stitch these together into the structure of a molecule? And as I look at the data that we have available, and keep in mind that the IR data indicate there's a hydroxy group, I'm going to take this most downfield signal here, the, hydro the signal that is at about 3.9 ppm, and I'm going to go ahead and tentatively call that our hydroxy group, because none of the other signals in the spectrum would make sense to be a hydroxy group. So I'm going to assign that as a hydroxy group, CH2, CH, and two methyl groups. So now we need to think about how to piece together this structure. As I've mentioned before, it's useful if you can pick out some aspect of the molecule that is likely one terminal of the compound or the other to begin from that position. And indeed, if we have these methyl groups, methyl groups are going to be some terminal, some end of the molecule. So based on our data here, we have two CH3 groups that we predict have to be symmetrical to one another within the molecule. So how can we make two methyl groups that are symmetrical to one another in the molecule? Well, the way that I think of straight away is that if we have an isopropyl group within our molecule, that's going to create two methyl groups that are symmetrical to one another. And those two methyl groups I'll highlight here and here. So they're symmetrical because they're bonded to the same carbon atom, that same CH right here. Moreover, we observe that the methyl groups give a doublet signal. The doublet signal indicates to us, since this is a doublet, that there must be just one vicinal hydrogen because N plus one with one vicinal hydrogen, we give one plus one equals two, which is our doublet that we see here. So keeping that in mind, this makes sense that we would have this CH group here because that means that if we look at any of these hydrogen atoms, this hydrogen right here, and we say how many hydrogens are vicinal to it as one vicinal hydrogen, one plus one makes two, which is our doublet. So this is looking really promising here as a terminal of the molecule. We have this isopropyl type end to the molecule, and that would account for both of those methyl groups that are symmetrical to one another. So I'm going to put that in as a check mark. And this is a common theme that you'll see since isopropyl branches are common in molecules. It's a good thing to be on the lookout for. The next atom that we see in the chain is we plugged in a CH group because that was our prediction based on the fact that our methyl groups were a doublet. So we look for something in our NMR data that integrates to one that would be a candidate for being this CH group. And indeed, when we come to here, we see this pretty impressive multiplet going on, which is what I'm going to predict corresponds to that CH group by process of elimination. It's the only thing that integrates to one in this spectrum that could fit right there based on the multiplicity. So therefore, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and label that CH right here as having a chemical shift that is at about 1.75 ppm, doesn't have to be exact. And looking at the number of sub peaks there, meaning the multiplicity, what I'm seeing is that it looks like there might be a tiny blip right here at the far left of the peak. So I'm going to call that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm going to label this as having a multiplicity of nine. 
And since we use the n plus 1 rule to determine the multiplicity, that means the n plus 1 has to equal 9. So n equals 8, meaning 8 vicinal hydrogens. We've accounted for six of those, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, with the two methyl groups. So that means that we need a CH2 group over here in order for the multiplicity to work out to being 9. So multiplicity equals 9, which means that we have eight vicinal hydrogens six from the methyl groups, two from putting a CH2 group in there. So that will work out. Um, in the interest of dotting all my I's and crossing all my T's, I'm going to label the information about the methyl groups that we plugged in as well. Those two methyl groups we said were a doublet, and they showed up at about 0.9 ppm, so very shielded in a very electron-donating, not electron-withdrawing environment. And that's making sense so far since they are adjacent to this alkyl-type group here. So coming along the chain to our... CH2 group that we have hypothesized in here, we have to ask, where is that in our proton NMR spectrum? So looking at our proton NMR spectrum, we labeled in the types of groups they see, and we see one CH2 group here. So I'm going to label that up here, hypothesizing that that is our CH2 group that is at about 3.4 ppm. And it has a multiplicity that is a doublet, so I'm going to put a D in there. For that to be a doublet, that means it needs to have one vicinal hydrogen. So that means the only hydrogen that can be vicinal to it is the one that is adjacent here to the right. And so that means that whatever we plug into the left can have no vicinal hydrogens. So we ask, what can we plug into the left? Well, we eliminate things that we have already put into the molecule, which was our CH group here at about 1.75 ppm. We already plugged that in our CH2 group at 3.4 ppm, we just plugged in, so I'm gonna put a check mark on that. So all that leaves behind in our proton NMR spectrum is the hydroxy group that was right here at about 3.9. So let's see, can we plug the hydroxy group in right here and have the chemical shift ranges work out correctly and have the multiplicities work out correctly, the IR data work out correctly, and all that other good stuff. So that hydroxy proton we said was at about 3.9 ppm and a singlet as we expect for hydroxy groups or NH groups as well are singlets generally. And so does the structure that we have created that I am going to circle here add up based on all of the data? So we ask, do the number of rings and pi bonds add up correctly? So rings and pi bonds was zero and indeed there are zero rings and pi bonds in the structure we've provided. IR data, the main thing we saw was that there's no carbonyl group. There is an expected hydroxy group. We indeed have put that into our structure. And then we can look at the molecular formula as well. C4H10O does our structure have four carbons, 10 hydrogens, and an oxygen. It has four carbons. And indeed, if we count up all the hydrogens, it has 10 hydrogens and it has one oxygen atom. So we're good to go on that. And then our NMR data, those add up as well based on the fact that if we look at the multiplicities that we've assigned and the chemical shift ranges, we see the most downfield hydrogens that are bonded to a carbon are here at 3.4 ppm. If we look at the table of expected NMR values, that's right in line with a carbon it's hydrogens that are directly bonded to an alcohol group. So that all works out very nicely, giving us as our final proposed structure where all of the data makes sense. We've dotted all the I's and crossed all our T's to come up with the structure that I'm highlighting here toward the middle of the screen. So that is, again, much like we did in our previous videos, you want to go through the data and make sure that everything makes sense. If any of the data don't correspond to the compound, it seems like the data has some errors in it, like the rings and pi bonds don't add up, or the chemical shifts are weird, or the multiplicities are weird. That means that there's some error in the structure and you need to go back and do some trial and error to sort out how you can make the logic puzzle work out. Think of this very much as puzzle solving. So I highly recommend now that we have done some of these problems together that you take a close look at the chapter 13 worksheet to practice additional problems because you will be doing this sort of thing on the upcoming project and so you'll want to be really sharp on it 
since you can ask all sorts of questions now. We can go through practice problems related to NMR, but when it comes time for the project, you are going to be um, on your own and solving that structure. So get the practice in now, do the work, and things will go well.